here today. It's uh, great to see so many different groups of people here. We have uh, students, we have faculty, staff, former faculty. It's, uh, it's really wonderful. Um, and thank you again for joining us also um, either in person or via YouTube since we also live stream this uh, event here today. Um, so welcome to Green College and its Center for Politics and the People. Uh, I'm Hendrik Schatzinger and uh, I am the co-director of the center along with my colleague, um, Professor Brian Smith. Brian, where are you? So he's in the, in the back. Um, it is <clears throat> my pleasure to introduce to you David Helperin, who engages in public advocacy and advises organizations uh, on um, policy, politics, communications, and legal matters. Um, he currently works on issues including higher education, climate change and energy, uh, open government, and our today's topic, money and uh, politics. Uh, he's also uh, of counsel to public resource uh, <coughs> board, and uh, he was previously um, uh, involved in many different capacities. For example, he was the founding uh, director of Campus Progress and senior vice president at the Center for American Progress. Uh, he was the senior policy advisor for Howard Dean's uh, presidential campaign. He was the founding executive director of the American Constitution Society. He was also a White House speechwriter and special assistant for national security affairs uh, to President Clinton. Uh, and the list goes on here. He was also co-founder of the internet company uh, Real Networks, and he was also counsel to the Senate Intelligence Committee. He graduated from Yale College and Yale Law School. Uh, his articles have appeared in many different outlets, uh, for example, the New York Times, uh, Washington Post, The Nation, Foreign Policy, and uh, other outlets. We are pleased to have him here today with us. Uh, please join me in welcoming David Halperin to our conversation today. So, you know, in terms of format, what we will do is we'll have a conversation for the first 25, 30 minutes, and then we'll open up to questions from you, the audience. So in the meantime, we can both, uh, you know, sit down and relax a little bit. Um, maybe you can just share a little bit uh, with us um, what your what your background is, uh, David, and how you get interested in both public uh, advocacy, but also then how that relates to money in politics. Hi everyone, I'm really glad to be here at Ripon and um, with Professor Schatzinger and and the rest of you. Um, and I appreciate you coming. Um, I grew up uh, outside Washington, D.C., a um, very political town, obviously. <laughs> but I wanted to be a singer instead, so I'm pleased to be holding this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I didn't, I, I don't know why, I think I probably should have stayed as a singer, especially after watching last night's debate. <laughs> that would be better. Um, as I went through college, I got aware that there were a lot of things going on in the world. There were civil wars in Central America. Um, there was a nuclear arms race with Russia that we didn't seem to be containing. We, our hostages were held uh, in the US Embassy in Iran by Iranian uh, radicals. There was a lot happening that started to interest me. President uh, Carter and then President Reagan brought back draft registration. This wasn't very long after the Vietnam War had ended. And I got interested in these issues, especially about nuclear weapons and, and what we would do with them. So uh, after college, I took a job uh, working on nuclear arms control and um, I decided it was something I wanted to stay with. I got interested in other issues. I went forward, became a lawyer. And increasingly, as I've worked on a whole range of issues, I've become aware of how much big money does dominate uh, politics and policy and produces bad outcomes on all kinds of issues. Why, you know, why is it so hard for people to find good jobs anymore? Um, why banks get to rip you off and get away with it and you can't sue them? Why are we tearing up our communities um, uh, to find new sources of energy and then, and then even then taking the energy and sending it overseas rather than keeping it here? Um, why do we have uh, a quarter of our higher education money going to schools that are ripping off veterans and single moms and other people that are for-profit enterprises? 
Um, all of those things, it turns out, in my judgment, the answer is that there's lobbying in Washington and big money can hire whatever lobbyist you want to say whatever you want. And so increasingly what I work on are issues where we're on the other side of those lobbyists and we're trying to get a better outcome that would be better for, for citizens. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, if you don't mind, let me kind of throw a little curveball at you okay. here. Um, so if we're looking at the amounts of money that we see at the federal level, right? So um, we can look at last year's lobbying expenditures, you know, roughly official numbers, of course, uh, you know, depending on what is being disclosed, like $3.2 billion, right? If you're looking at the 2012 uh, election, since it's an you know, ongoing election, we have to see where we end up finally in our, in our total. In 2012, we had roughly $7 billion that were uh, raised and spent. <clears throat> On federal elections, um, we can add three billion dollars at the state and local level. So, at, you know, looking at ten billion dollars plus three, you know, so on, on lobbying, that's thirteen billion dollars. But you know, for some people, that's a lot of money, right? But when we can look at the federal budget, and uh, there we see roughly four trillion dollars in terms of spending. And if we take this, you know, as a percentage, suddenly we're looking at like 025 percent of money that's being you know, spent on, on politics, right, or on campaign contributions, hard money contributions. And so my question then is, if you take other numbers, like the GDP, for example, and now we're looking at like, you know, $18 trillion, so a tiny, tiny fraction of money really goes into politics. Americans spend more money on ice cream than they spend on politics. So uh, how can, why is, my question is, why is there so little money in politics? <laughs> well, <laughs> And, and in fact, you know, there's more to it. Some of the money spent in politics is good. Individual citizens are giving money. They gave money to Howard Dean. They gave it to Bernie Sanders. They're giving it to Donald Trump. And that's people expressing themselves and saying, we want to be involved in the system. We have some stake in these candidates. And, a lot, and some of the spending is good. It's on outreach. It's mobilizing people, getting people interested in issues. So that's, it's not bad. What's bad to me is how cheaply politicians can be bought. When you look at how much actually a lot of members of Congress get from industries that they then act on behalf of, essentially, sometimes the contributions are small, like $10,000, but they'll, they will still do it. So it's not so much the volume of money in politics is a problem. It's how money, what, at whatever amount, can influence politics and lead to bad decisions because politicians can be bought actually for pretty cheap amounts. Okay, so what specifically does money buy? I think you mentioned sort of policy outcomes, right? But I mean, we can we can start from looking starting looking at access, right? So in terms of the time members of Congress and others may be willing to spend with you, we can look at maybe the agenda and you know uh, in, in politics, uh, we can look at uh, the time and energy dedicated uh, that members of Congress are willing to put forward into certain issues. Or what do you, I mean, based on your observation, sort of where, where is that influence specifically in, uh, in Washington or in Congress specifically? Money buys you access. Uh, Every day members of Congress leave uh, Congress to go to um, little receptions where they, people come and all the people there are lobbyists. And they all pull you aside and say, <coughs> why don't you think about this, or we have this wonderful plan to do that. And those are things that the lobbyists can buy that most people can't buy. So members of Congress are spending a lot of time every day listening to lobbyists talk. Lobbyists also not at a fundraiser can make appointments to see you. Now, if you want to go see your member of Congress and talk about taxes or talk about unions or talk about budget deficits, you may not get an appointment with your member of Congress. You might get a staff member. Now, why can't, say, the for-profit college industry get a meeting right away with a senator? Because the chief lobbyist for that industry for years has been Trent Lott, who was the Senate majority Republican leader. So he can call Mitch McConnell, and Mitch McConnell's gonna take that meeting. That industry, which gets 90% of its money from our tax dollars, can afford to take that money, your money, and hire Trent Lott to have a meeting with Mitch McConnell 
where he argues that his industry should continue to take our tax dollars. So they can buy, rich industries can buy not just uh, campaign contributions and meetings, but super fancy people that can get the attention of members, Democrats and Republicans, like Dick Gephardt, former House uh, Majority Leader for the Democrats, is a lobbyist for many, many industries working against all the things that he said he stood for when he was a member of Congress. Money buys these people, and then they can get access to members. Many of the top lobbyists in Washington are former members of Congress, whether it's Bob Dole, John Bro. Um, these folks go in, they're hired not because they're handsome or charming or anything else, but because they already have access. They can use the House gymnasium, they can exercise next to Paul Ryan and talk with him about these issues, and you and I can't do that. So money buys a lot, and it buys access, and it also buys all kinds of other ways to participate in the political process. When you watch ads on TV, I don't know about you, you probably see a lot of political ads on TV, but I see a lot of ads about I'm an energy voter. Do you see those ads, I'm an energy voter? Those ads are on all the time. The people in them, of course, are actors, not energy voters. <laughs> and those are paid for by uh, fossil fuel companies. Um, we can't buy ads like that. Actually, I did find out once that you could buy ads in DC. Uh, we were running a campaign against um, uh, on an issue, and we were able to buy ads on uh, just in DC alone on Fox and Friends and Morning Joe for $100. This was about 10 years ago. And so I thought that was a great bargain. And then the other side accused us of running a multi-million dollar ad. <laughs> My intern made the ad for free. You can also buy fake grassroots organizing. You can buy hundreds and thousands of letters generated by supposedly real people, in fact, non-existent people, writing to members of Congress to say to do this or that. There are organizations that specialize in that. So you can buy a lot of political power, influence, friends for money. And, that, and as you say, in the scheme of things, not that much money, but you can leverage a small investment in politics into a big investment, uh, or into a big financial return. Because as Washington and, reg and the regulatory environment and the legal environment in Washington determines a lot of outcomes in business, a, your investment in, in Washington lobbying and, and politics is one of the, you know, could be one of the smartest investments you ever make. Instead of investing in your workers, your plants, anything else, invest in Washington, often it's a great return on investment. Not that I'm endorsing it. <laughs> <laughs> what you were saying sounds a little bit depressing overall, right? So, <laughs> so a little bit depressing. So, but, as we could look for some bright spots when it comes to campaign finance, right? And so, you know, one thing we could say is that, look, Jeb Bush didn't, didn't win the nomination for the Republican Party. It was Donald Trump. Donald Trump has received <laughs> roughly 30% of his donations come from small donors. That is, small donors are usually defined as those who give less than $200 uh, during the election. Um, compared to uh, Clinton, for example, who in, in her case is only 17% of the money comes from small uh, donors, right? And so um, doesn't that say something about the the power that uh, small donors, but also like that big money does not have overall over the political process. Yes, and uh, the Citizens United case was decided by the Supreme Court six years ago. We could talk about the case if you want, but a lot of people said that would be the end and money would totally dominate politics until the end of the republic, which may be coming after this election, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it didn't. Jeb Bush was the big money candidate. And he lost, and, and citizens voted for the worst candidate who's ever run, but still a candidate that was a grassroots supported candidate. So money did not win that. Money had more influence on the Democrat side this time. But you see again and again that something else does matter in our system besides money. One thing, of course, is just performance, that's true. But another is the truth, and sometimes big money candidates lose or big money issues lose because the truth is on the side of, uh, you know, of the other side of the issue. So I don't think any structural change uh, like Citizens United or getting rid of Citizens United is going to, uh, and Citizens United is the case that said that corporations, for-profit or non-profit corporations, 
um, cannot be barred as a, as a law tried to make them from uh, participating in advocating for the election or re-election of a candidate close to the election. But I don't think that decision or any other will is determinative. Uh, you know, unless it was this really radical decision, I think that there are always ways that people can communicate around money, whether it's in an election or in a, a legislative fight, and get things done. So uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that people will continue to be able to influence things no matter how much money is put into the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk about Citizens United and its aftermath uh, for a second, right? So if we're just kind of, again, take a step back here, and uh, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that corporations, labor unions, uh, also nonprofit organizations, can spend an unlimited amount of independent uh, spending on campaigns. And this is sort of, this gave rise to super PACs, and nowadays what we see more and more is uh, uh, 501c4 uh, organizations uh, who do not have to disclose their donors. This is where the term dark money uh, comes in. And so I'm just wondering how you see the, the, the aftermath, basically, of Citizens United uh, uh, in terms of the explosion, you could say, of independent expenditures. Well, I, I will say, I'm, I sit on the board of the organization Public Citizen, which, have you heard of that? Public Citizen, started by Ralph Nader 40 years ago, is one of the um, premier consumer organizations. I've been on the board there for 10 years, and I will say I do not speak for them in this context because they have been one of the strongest advocates of getting rid of the Citizens United decision. I happen to think Citizens United may well have been correctly decided. In that case, it was about a conservative group that wanted to make a movie saying that Hillary Clinton was bad. This was in 2007. And the Federal Election Commission wanted to say, well, then you can't do that because it's too close to the election and it's not fair for corporations to be influencing the election. This was a nonprofit corporation. I think that that is core political speech, whether you know it's people speaking out, collect, coming together, putting together some money, and saying, that we, you know, this is what we think should happen in politics. I don't know that that was right for the government to try to ban that. What if here you wanted to set up an art exhibit, paintings of Donald Trump or paintings of Hillary Clinton, and the Federal Election Commission came in and said, no, it's too close to the election, you're a nonprofit corporation, you can't show that. So I have a concern that, that Citizens United went too far. They said, oh, well, it doesn't apply if you're a journalistic outfit. They, get outlet. they can continue to be a corporation talking about election, but what is a journalist these days? Do everyone, anyone out there have a blog? I do. Are you a journalist? Am I a journalist? So I think that that case may have been correctly decided. What I think was not well decided after that was, a, was some court decisions in a landscape that allows people to make unlimited donations to organizations without accountability. I think money is not speech. Speech is speech. But money donations, I think, can be limited consistent with the Constitution. And I also think that when corporations give money or engage in political speech, that, that, that people have a right to know that. The shareholders have a right to know it, the public has a right to know it, especially a for-profit corporation. So there could be more awareness and accountability, so maybe you can't stop Exxon from making a movie saying, vote for Jeb Bush or vote against Hillary Clinton. But the Exxon shareholders and the public have a right to know that, and we can decide whether we want to continue to invest in Exxon, whether we want to get gas at Exxon, whether, whether in fact, you know, if that knowledge is out there, people can be more informed and make more informed choices. But I'm, in general, I'm in favor of speech, not limiting speech, but people being able to look at who's speaking and decide, you know, based on that, what you think of the speaker. <clears throat> so just again, for clarification purposes, uh, looking at Citizens United, what the, what the court ruled, right, is that organizations uh, can um, engage and express advocacy even within 60 days leading up to the general election and 30 days leading up to the primary election. Uh, and if we're just looking at the, at the dark money side again one more time, right, uh, some people are arguing that, you know what, this is actually a pretty good system because uh, otherwise if you don't uh, allow for some degree of anonymity, it may chill speech, right? It, has, it, may, it may have a chilling effect. And, you know, I'm looking at some quotes here that I found. Uh, some people have called it the saving bomb of emerging voices. 
it's a scorn of entrenched powers and so on. And so how do you respond to this uh, uh, argument that uh, if everything is being disclosed, it may actually chill speech? I think if you're an individual, you have a right to give some money to a political cause, to a to a advocacy group. You don't have a right to give to a political candidate more than two hundred dollars. Everybody's going to know. But if you want to give to a group that's speaking out on an issue, I think you should have a right to continue to be able to do that anonymously. But when you're giving a hundred thousand dollars, or when you're giving money of a public corporation who people have invested their money in, then I think people should have the right to know what you're doing. When it's big money, you can protect yourself. And people ought to know also of that of of gifts of that size, and when it's um, when it's a corporation, then again um, a, a, a business corporation, I think people should have a right to judge what's going on. But so I think you can protect individuals' right to uh, uh, secretly contribute to advocacy, uh, and at the same time do do public service by requiring larger entities to disclose. So let's take a look at what you know is being done with all that money, uh, you know, especially after Citizens United. Um, a lot of actually, really, a big chunk of the money goes towards negative ads, right? TV ads, right? And I don't know, have you guys seen any negativity in this in this campaign? Um, uh, you know, obviously, you know, I'm just you know um, not serious here. But in terms of, I mean, what we my my question is, what does all that negativity that we see, all these negative, negativity, negative ads do to um, maybe our perception of uh, our political institutions, how we see politicians, how much confidence or lack of confidence we have these days in our political process, in the, in the, in the electoral process, and overall in our institutions. Well, it's depressing, but obviously it works. Are they, these people are not fools, some of them are. <laughs> but mostly people are hiring professionals who understand what works in politics. And so-called comparative ads, if you want to say a positive version, seems to work more than positive ads. So that's, that's the nature of it. It's, it's our own fault. We get the ads we deserve, basically. If people want to engage more positively, they can provide that feedback. And they can vote against candidates that relentlessly run negative ads, but they don't do that. So there, I mean, the ads are just one piece. There are other ways. You, you can go to um, Hillary Clinton's website, for example, and there are thousands of pages of policy positions you fall asleep, but they are detailed. They are talking about problems that we have in our country. You saw that on prior candidates. Democrat and Republicans have that. You can go to their own events and listen to them give speeches, which aren't necessarily negative. But for whatever reason, we like our ads negative, and I think if you know, if the only way to stop that is for people to speak out, demonstrate their the fact that they don't like it. But clearly, at this point, we like it. We like it, so that's why it happened. Mm -hmm. You know, since uh, the theme for today is sort of the current election and uh, and um, money in politics, I'm wondering as far what do you see in terms of just campaign contribute campaign contributions. And election outcomes. To what to what extent uh, do these contributions really affect um, election outcomes? I know we touched on it a little bit earlier. We talked about sort of you know the Jeb Bush uh, um, example, but uh, I think maybe one concern could be right that a lot of money is flowing to incumbents uh, in many organizations, uh, especially I want to say. Um, Structurally, quite conservative, right? Uh, they they prefer giving money to incumbents. But I'm wondering, sort of, what do you what do you see in terms of election outcomes and, and the contributions? I mean, it, you do need money to run a campaign. Sometimes the less funded, the lower funded candidate wins. But uh, but yes, I mean, money is still sort of a lifeblood of, of uh, many campaigns, um, and. It's also true that incumbents have other advantages. We've seen redistricting in this country that's pretty much locked in many of these congressional districts. They're not competitive at all. And what that leads to, of course, is primaries, which is a related problem where no one's at, everyone's running the primary to be the most Democratic Democrat or the most Republican Republican. Then you get more extreme parties. I would argue more on the Republican side, but some of you will disagree. 
And then you have two groups in Congress that can't talk with each other. When I was a kid, you had plenty of conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans in our Congress, and there was a lot more opportunity to get things done. Now it's really, really hardened, and you have people come in, you had the majority leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, say my goal is to get rid of Obama, and there's no possibility of any deal. I work on uh, you know, issues including education, the environment, um, access to government information. Um, there's no chance at any legislation. All the work we do in Washington on policy now is about regulations that the White House uh, can issue um, and hope that Congress doesn't act to overturn them, which they can't because there's no chance of that legislation either. So it's basically the game in Washington now is argue about regulations, which involves a process of regulations being proposed and everybody issuing comments and then the regulation gets published. And then whatever industry is regulated files a lawsuit. So you argue in court. That's it. There's no, no laws are being made related to anything. Maybe there's like a national squash day being uh, announced or I, I mean a vegetable, but also probably the spore. But there's, there's no meaningful legislation. We have so many problems in this country. We're the greatest supposedly democracy in history. We have the richest country in history. And our Congress does almost nothing. Almost no laws are ever passed anymore. What, what, is, what is happening? And part of it is, um, is this redistricting, is this locking in of, of Democrat, Republican districts? Um, part of it is that money uh, uh, influence prevents reforms. Um, and, and the fact that we are very divided, numer you know, actually not just locked in, but, but the, numerically, if you, if you actually look around the country, that we, are, we are increasingly, increasingly divided. It's a depressing thing, and it's a, that's sort of a separate phenomenon from money. Money, you know, I, I think I mentioned already once, I've spoken, I think, already five times today, that um, uh, I was asked in 2007 um, by the American Prospect Magazine to come up with a new slogan for the Republican Party, which had just suffered a crushing defeat. Uh, in the congressional uh, mid uh, midterm elections. And I said the Republican Party slogan, the accurate slogan should be rich people and angry people coming together. <laughs> and, so, you know, the Republican Party year after year has voted for the country club Republican candidate of rich people until this year when the angry people won. But now, so now you have a party that's split between rich people and angry people. You have, on the Democrat side, you've got kind of the corporate Goldman Sachs wing of the party, which is a um, nominated candidate whom I admire, but who is too much for me part of that wing, Hillary Clinton. You've got kind of the Bernie Sanders-ish wing of the party. And I think you also have communities of color not really feeling necessarily that close to either of those. So you have a country that's split into at least four or five pieces, maybe more. And increasingly, I don't see the common ground or the, you know, a, or an easy path to actually coming up with common sense solutions to any problems. I don't think that answered your question. No, it's, okay. <laughs> it's okay. I will give you just one last question, and I'll open up to the audience. But uh, you know, one thing interesting thing happened when Obama, you know, took office. Right, one of the first uh, couple of days or so, uh, he issued an executive order and uh, changed some of the rules uh, that have to do with the revolving door. And it had a, a kind of a paradoxical kind of effect uh, since what we have seen since then is actually a decrease in the number of lobbyists who officially register as a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. That number is going down every single year. Now, does anyone of you believe that we have fewer lobbyists than today than we had you know, seven or eight years ago? Probably not, right? And so basically uh, what has happened is that people are using various loopholes not to register as a lobbyist. So, uh, under the official rules, you have to spend 20% of your time uh, engaging in lobbying activities. Now, who is going to monitor exactly whether somebody spends 15% or 25% of their time on, on lobbying activities? But I'm wondering, sort of, I don't know, do you have any ideas? And, you know, you are interested in transparency and disclosure and all of these things. How do we get to a system where we can really identify clearly, you know, who is engaging? primarily or at least in part in lobbying activities. 
Here's one where even if you had good intentions, it's hard exactly to figure out how to fix this, but it can be done. So President Obama said, lobbyists cannot serve in my administration right away. That included somebody I know who was the most qualified person to be the Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights, who is now, in fact, in that job, but initially couldn't get it. Why? He was a lobbyist. Who was he a lobbyist for? Human Rights Watch, a nonprofit group. What he lobbied for was human rights. There was no issue of a conflict of interest or special interest that he was going through a revolving door to make money and do bad things. He was the right person for that job, but the rule technically barred him from being a lobbyist. Meanwhile, President Obama's communications director for his campaign was named Anita Dunn, a dem longtime Democrat. She served in the White House with the president at the beginning of his term. Then she left and became a lobbyist for many, many industries, not just that were corporation interests, but interests directly opposed to Obama initiatives. She represented the for-profit education industry. I know I keep coming back to that, but it's a serious one. Schools that were ripping off students and veterans and single moms. And she represented them to try to specifically to stop an initiative by President Obama. She represented the food industry to try to stop regulations that were dealing with issues like childhood obesity. And she represented other special interests against Obama. And she never registered as a lobbyist because she apparently didn't feel she met the threshold. I, I've been told she's still meeting on some of these issues. She was worked for Obama, then she worked to undermine Obama, then she rejoined Obama for campaign 2012 again, and then she went back to lobbying to undermine Obama and issues. That's what Washington has become, and she didn't count as a lobbyist. So we need a rule somehow that doesn't let my friend, uh, that lets my friend be the Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights, but doesn't let uh, Anita Dunn necessarily come into the government if she's going to be doing this revolving door thing. And there's a way to do that, unfortunately, in order to enact such a law, you would have to come up against what group? Lobbyists. And lobbyists are, you know, represent any industry that pays them, and they certainly would stand up for the interests of lobbyists. So they're going to make it harder. They've been pressing some, many of the bundlers for Hillary Clinton, the people who raised the big money for her, are lobbyists. And, uh, you know, there are events every week in Washington of, for Hillary, fundraising events for Hillary Clinton, which is just a gathering of lobbyists and also people looking for jobs in the administration so they can then leave and be lobbyists. So unfortunately, there's a very deep culture. Washington is becoming a much more prosperous city with fancy restaurants and every neighborhood becoming gentrified. And a lot of that money is from lobbying. And young people who used to say, oh, I'll come to Washington to change the world and then eventually get corrupted and sell out, now come to Washington and say, how many years do I have to work in these congressional offices of OPEI before I get to be a lobbyist and make the big money? So there's been a, our politics are becoming commodified in Washington. Careers in Washington are, are expressly about making money, whether you're Democrats or Republicans, and it, it, is, it is a big problem. So um, there, even if you had good intentions, there's a challenge to deal with this, and most people in Washington do not. Uh, thank you. This, I will throw out like two or three more numbers to get, 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 uh, give more context, right? And uh, Tim, don't, don't quote me on this, but I, I think the number of you know, official uh, lobbyists in Washington is somewhere around 12,000 right now, right? Uh, but unofficial numbers say you know, there could be 80 or 100,000 sort of influence peddlers in Washington, D.C., again, who have not registered that as formal lobbyists. Um, and many, and most of them, pretty much nobody calls himself a lobbyist in the first place, right? Uh, they are like, uh, they, they are working uh, in the field of advocacy or public advocacy or whatever we call it exactly. Uh, and so that's that. And in terms of dark money, again, to give just a little bit of context, in 2012, we saw uh, around $300 million that were uh, given uh, through these uh, channels. People saw it, uh, also put the scientists that we will see actually a, a large increase this year, even more so, but it has, actually hasn't happened, so we might end up somewhere in, that same, in the same ballpark. Anyways, uh, time to open up uh, for questions from, from the audience, uh, and there's one quick one here. I'll from follow up on what you just said, Henrik. One person's lobbyist, another person's public interest advocate. Mm -hmm. Mr. Halpern, you said one solution is to pass a law that would allow your friend to become the Assistant Secretary of State because that's one of the good ones, an advocate for human rights. Who can argue with that? But who is to determine what are the good and the bad public interest areas for which somebody should be able to go through the revolving door and go from being a lobbyist to serving in a position of power? I think that is a really good question. Could you just repeat the question? 
questions they were putting uh, forward. Oh, sorry. Videos. So how would you decide who's a good lobbyist and who's a bad lobbyist, who should be prohibited from serving in government um, and, and who shouldn't? And that's right. And you can't do it based on for-profit versus non-profit because, I mean, you know, from my perspective, some of the nonprofit groups, some of the biggest nonprofit groups in Washington are the American Petroleum Institute and other lobby groups for industry. They are technically nonprofits, but they 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 lobby for special interests. And you know, uh, someone else might say, "Well, what are you talking about? Those are the good ones in Washington. It's your human rights guy that ought to be barred because we hate human rights." So I do think it is a tricky question, um, and uh, you know, uh, one way to do it is. Through waivers, the, the administration oddly did not waive for my friend to be the assistant secretary, but they waived someone else who worked for defense contractors to get a big job in the Pentagon. I actually, I do, I think it's an excellent question. I don't have the answer to it, but I do think if it if it was driven by the principle that your lobbying was based on your sincere policy views rather than that your organization is being funded by groups that are. Uh, that are funding that the group is primarily engaged in advancing commercial interests is one way of trying to deal with the issue. With the issue is revolving door. Are you selling yourself in order to advance other people's interests as opposed to are you acting on sincere principles? But even that is tricky. Some of the groups that have called themselves uh, internet advocacy groups are funded by all the big uh, tech companies. So, uh, so. I, I think it's a really good question, and I don't have the answer, but I do think if people could sit down with some goodwill, maybe you could figure out some, you know, some answers to it, and people are not doing that. Thank you. Um, other questions? Uh, let's go with the student. Uh, Rose. So you kind of painted a bleak but real picture of how Congress is working right now in terms of trying to pass regulations. And the issue of corporations not having to disclose um, at a certain level how much they um, campaigns is really concerning for me. So I was wondering, is there a way for consumers to pressure, uh, to pressure companies into disclosing, or how can is there a strategy in which consumers can be involved in this process to change that? Yes, it's a really good question. It's how can consumers be involved in trying to press to find out what corporations are spending, not on campaigns, if they're not really allowed to do that, but how much they're spending on advocacy about elections and who should be elected. And so you can be you can be active as a shareholder is one way some shareholders are taking action and saying companies ought to be disclosing. Or you can say that the um, some are pressing President Obama without a law, again, we can't pass any laws, to say that federal contractors, uh, companies that take money from the federal government and do business with the federal government should have to disclose their campaign uh, related contributions. Uh, if you could pass a law, you could say that public companies should be required to do that, whether they're federal contractors or not. Do you have more? Um, you know, just for clarification purposes, right? So corporations cannot give directly to candidates and political parties what they can do and what they are doing. There are 4,500 PACs, political action committees, right? And so, uh, and what they, and what also individuals and corporations can do is to give $5,000 per election where the primary counts as one election, the general election is separate, always separate um, election, so $10,000 yeah, total, right? Uh, now, this is hard money, as we call it, right? Uh, cash contributions. And, you know, as far as cash contributions are concerned, I'm actually really impressed with the level of transparency in this country. I think there's no other country in the world where you can actually track uh, these kind of contributions as quickly as, as here. So what I often go to is opensecrets.org, and I encourage people to actually check out where the money, where the money is coming from, and where the money is going. Um, it's a very helpful website. You can also look at uh, fec.gov, right? The Federal Election Commission. Um, there's also websites on state money and politics. If you're looking at the at the state level, uh, Wisconsin is pretty good in terms of its disclosure when it comes to lobbying. Actually, so we still have very good uh, disclosure on that front. But I think you know it's a it's it's really the question is a little bit more about what about that again that money that we can't track right the independent expenditures that flow into this in these dark money channels uh, and that's that, that's a tough one right so, uh, and as you as you said part of it this can be sort of you know pressure uh, from shareholders or others to uh, to kind of you know see where you know um, where yeah how much to what extent is the money coming you know from those organizations and, and corporations. 
Um, let's see, there's some other uh, questions. Yes, please. I'd like to hear a little more on policy, so I'm going to give you a hypothetical. Let's assume that um, as a result of this election, the presidency in both houses of Congress they do. Are there specific concrete steps, for example, to deal with the two problems you laid out at the beginning of this talk? Lobbying and then somewhat different problem, use of money in campaigns. So the question is under a unified government, uh, what kind of uh, <clears throat> reforms would you like to see both in terms of the um, maybe level of contribution but also lobbying reforms? I would like to see um, the, the decisions that limited, um, uh, that, that permitted unlimited contributions, like there's a case recently called McCutcheon that said that they could, there couldn't be a total limit on the amount one person gives. There could be a limit on the amount one person gives to a particular candidate, but you can't stop you know, the guy in Las Vegas from giving a thousand contributions to a thousand different candidates. There's, the, the overall limit is unconstitutional. I would like to see an effort to reverse that, because I think, again, money is not speech. I would like to see the things I mentioned uh, in response to her question about uh, more disclosure for corporate donations to uh, independent expenditure PACs uh, on elections. But mostly, I'm not as interested in structural changes on money in politics as some people are, because I do have concerns about free speech, um, and because I think that people are always going to find a way around them anyway. My view, what I would like to do is defeat the special interests issue by issue on the issues that I care about, like climate change and education um, uh, and health care and, and prices of drugs and things like that and, and, and banking and consumer relationships with their banks and things like that. And so uh, for me, my job is mostly focused on uh, what I actually do back in Washington is not so much focused on how do we get money out of politics, it's how do we defeat big money in these fights by exposing how bad their positions are on the issues and also by embarrassing people who should know better or should have better values who sell their, their uh, position, their access um, for cash and who took one position when they were in Congress and took another one when they got paid to take another one. So that's, that is my focus is sort of issue to issue combat against big money. And I think that if you had a courageous president of either party, you could stand up to a lot of these things and get things, you know, whether you're liberal or conservative. I mean, I'll give you an example of, can, can I talk just briefly about for-profit education? That is the issue I've worked the most on the last six years. $30 billion of our tax money, a quarter of all federal financial aid has been going to for-profit uh, colleges and universities. Some are good, most are not. Most overcharge, they're spending some, some of them less than $900 a year on education per student, um, whereas a place like Ripon is spending like $12,000. they are charging as much or more than Ripon to go there. They use deceptive and coercive tactics to sign up students. A marketing machine is basically what they are, um, <coughs> focusing on recruiting veterans and military service members, uh, first in their family to go to college people, people of color, single moms, um, and they've been doing it, getting 10% 10 10 of the students they've had uh, when, as they've grown, 10% of all U.S. college students, but they're responsible for 50% of all the student loan defaults because so many of the students drop out or graduate but can't get the jobs that they were promised. So here's a thing that Democrats should be opposed to because it's ripping off and destroying opportunity for low-income people. Republicans should be opposed to because it's massive waste, fraud, and abuse with our tax money. It's big government gone crazy to aid a private party. And yet, it's been going on blatantly right in front of our eyes for a long, long time. And only in the last five years has there been a crackdown. And yet, when this industry got caught, they didn't say, we're sorry, we're going to reform, we're going to do better. They hired Trent Lott, Dick Gephardt, and every other lobbyist in Washington to say that they were wonderful, and they kept on fighting, and they threatened, they made up, you know, uh, they sent a whole bunch of letters to all the organizations that I was working with to build a coalition on this issue, and said that I was taking money from Steve Eisman, the Wall Street uh, short seller. I had no connection to Steve Eisman. The letters came from fake, non-existent people. Um, 
they engage in every dirty trick to hide, try to hang on to this privileged position. They've been getting 90% of their revenue, many of these colleges, from taxpayers. And it's only in recent years that the bad publicity about how they've been ripping off people and the bad results they've been achieving has actually filtered down to students and now students are getting, um, uh, are getting wise to it and rolling this down and these companies like ITT Tech just fell apart, Corinthian College just fell apart last year. Um, and law enforcement is now investigating these companies. Some of the CEOs are actually going to prison for what they've done, abusing people. But all this went on right in front of our eyes. So this was money and politics gone wild. And so for me, I'm less concerned about saying that those people can't lobby, or they can't give campaign contributions, and more about saying they're crooks and they shouldn't be in this business and we should be fighting against them. And that's the, that's the kind of thing that I've been committed to. Yeah, that was a fairly long answer, but uh, <laughs> I will so say just uh, again to put this into context, you mentioned McCutcheon, uh, there was a Supreme Court uh, case in 2014 um, that used to be a uh, roughly $123,000 biannual aggregate contribution limit. So even if you were to max out your contributions as an individual to certain members of Congress and to PACs and so forth, right, you couldn't give more than that amount. That, uh, under this new uh, decision from the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, that limit is gone. So if you wanted to give to every member of Congress and every PAC out there, you can actually now give up to $3.6 million roughly in that ballpark, right? So it's a pretty, pretty big change for those who really want to, uh, you know, want to um, give more money. Um, let me just maybe ask a follow-up question. So in terms of policy changes, there was another Supreme Court case, uh, the Arizona case, where it basically shut down matching fund programs at the state level, which was, you know, the idea was to basically um, level the playing field also for like small donors. So they were, uh, you know, if you were to give as a small donor a certain amount, the, the state would actually match those funds uh, or uh, I think with a three to one match. Uh, now another idea could be to provide vouchers to citizens and say, let's give every citizen a voucher basically and, uh, and, and they can spend their $50 or so uh, on political candidates or political parties. And even though under the current Supreme Court that wouldn't fly, I'm wondering in theory, do you think sort of the idea of uh, leveling, leveling up and uh, having some kind of campaign matching fund program or uh, campaign vouchers is a good idea? I don't know. I mean, it's a lot of money, 50 times everybody. <laughs> and then, you know, if. A good number of Americans can't afford $50. If you don't, if you don't feel strong enough to, uh, about somebody to part with $50, or as, um, who was it the other day said, that's just three drinks, was it Mitt Romney? <laughs> some, some politician said, well, yeah, that's not much money. It's three drinks for my wife and I in New York. Um, uh, but I, I think if you, if you don't want to part with $25 or $50, then you probably don't feel that strongly. So I think it's kind of a if you have $50 and you've got to spend it, it's like when you're you know, at the airport and you're trying to get rid of your cash before you fly out um, of a country, you're buying stuff you don't want. So I'm not sure that, that that's that important to me. Okay. Um, other questions? Uh, sure, Marty. I just would like to clarify a few of things regarding Citizens United and the various groups because you've mentioned giving to campaigns and parties which is not ca uh, tax deductible. Right. And you've mentioned uh, political action committees, which I think also have to publish their donors, correct? For the political action committees that advocate on behalf of a particular candidate. Yes. Right. But now, how about these third type of groups, like Wisconsin Club for Growth? Right. They don't have to disclose. I think, and you can you can deduct uh, your tax uh, that uh, you can deduct that contribution from your federal income taxes because these are supposedly social welfare organizations. Yes. And yet, I believe this is not a filibuster, but uh, <laughs> Justice Kennedy, even in the Citizens United decision, wrote that candidates should not be able to coordinate their campaigns with these dark money groups. Right, yes. Yet we've seen recently documents that, for example, somebody gave 
hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Wisconsin Club for Growth, and written right on the check was the statement, because Scott Walker asked me to. And then they go out and run ads attacking Scott Walker's opponent in the recall election and supporting Scott Walker. And then they do a few other things on the side so they can say they're not exclusively a campaign organization. So is everything I just said correct? And, and why, how is that a candidate going out and asking people to give huge tax-deductible contributions to these so-called social action or social interest groups, social welfare groups of all things. Uh, how is that not coordination? Well, it would be coordinated. I mean, if, if I guess if he went to them, if you had a trial, if you put them on trial for violating the campaign finance laws, and he said, well, I just told them to give generally because we all agree that Wisconsin ought to have pro-growth policies, they might get away with it. In other words, he'd have, he'd have to show that he was telling them to do it because of the amount of money that they were spending on political advocacy. Some nonprofit groups that you described, you cannot take a tax deduction. <laughs> But it's the ones that are purely called social welfare, as you suggest, where they're only supposed to spend a very small amount of money on politics and advocacy. Those groups, um, uh, th those are tax deductible contributions. And yes, if you coordinate with a politician and you and make those donations for the purpose of trying to influence politics, yes, that would be illegal. So there, the, the, the problem there is not one of the conception of the law. It's of the fact that it's hard to enforce and people get away with stuff. So, yeah, I mean, if you don't mind, I will add two points to that. Uh, so, it's it's quite fascinating and it's uh, very confusing for citizens, right? As you said, federal one seat organizations, their pr primary purpose has to be that they have to be a social welfare organization. And so, what is happening is that organizations still air ads on TV or have flyers or brochures and so forth, right? But they say, look, many of them are what they call educational. They are not directly political ads. Now, if I give you, I will, I will show you 10 ads here on the screen and you, tell, and, I will, and you tell me which ones are educational and which ones are political, I can guess, I can guarantee you all will fail, right? Because it's, uh, it's almost impossible to, unless you have to really be a true expert to understand the differences between those kind of versions, right? And so that's one of the uh, effects that we see. Now, another observation is, yes, there are many unintended consequences that, that come with uh, that lack of, or with um, uh, Citizens United, especially with 501c4 organizations. So for example, uh, if we look at Jeb Bush's campaign, uh, he actually waited longer to announce his candidacy and part of it is because basically he was coordinating with super PACs and 501c4 organizations before he made the announcement, which is perfectly legal, but everything was set up in a way that basically indicates you know, um, that, there, that there was coordination before the announcement. Another example is uh, candidates, and we can pick anybody, but Marco Rubio was sort of more, more notorious uh, during the primary, right, where he actually uh, posts videos on his website or uh, that, um, has material in it, which what we might, you know, uh, might call B-roll footage, uh, and you were like, why is he posting that? It's perfectly legal, again, but basically he's posting the material, so super PACs and federal ones organizations can actually use that material for TV ads, right? And so, or another example, Ted Cruz, or Ted Cruz super PAC gave uh, an interview to Political, and they, and the organization said, we would like Ted Cruz to actually air uh, TV ads at this point in these and these states. They basically told, they told the public, but they told him, right? And which is, again, he didn't coordinate directly with the campaign, but they used the media to basically uh, make announcements, right? And so we can go on and on and on in terms of the kinds of loopholes that are out there that they are really um, exploiting. Um, let's see if there are some other, other questions. Uh, sure, Gary. Um, so far, it seems like the whole idea is discussed here that money in politics is bad. If, if I start a restaurant and, and you know, people, for, if the food is bad, the service is bad, and people don't come and I go out of business, shouldn't I do that? I mean, 
if I'm in politics and I'm not able to attract money, doesn't that mean I'm basically not a good political? I mean, isn't attracting money how we measure success? Isn't that good? I mean, to some extent, I think what you really should be trying to do is attract votes. And votes... Yeah, but those, they are, they're successful in attracting votes. But, but in that, there are other ways to attract votes besides attracting the richest people to give you money. The, yes, if, you, if no one gives you money, you are probably not a very inspiring or, or skilled politician if nobody's behind you. The question is who gives you money. If, if there's unlimited money in politics, no rules, no standards, no disclosure, then certain people in your town and in your country are going to get to decide who's in charge of everything. And the question is... Yeah, but they only have one vote. Right. But if they can saturate all day long TV with ads saying your opponent is a liar, if they can forge documents, there are no rules that show your opponent is a, you know, a murderer, if they can um, you know, uh, give every voter, if there's no rules, Let's say every voter gets a new, um, uh, a new Cadillac um, or, or a new Escalade, you know, um, because, because there's no rules. Then people are going to tend to vote because, potentially, because of basically they were corrupted. And that's the risk in a system where money can, can make people do things that, they don't, that, that aren't necessarily good for the country. You could say, well, this, this congressman is going to vote, or woman is going to vote to uh, uh, close down all the, all the factories in the country and have no jobs and send them over to another country where there are lower wages. And you could say, well, but I am going to get my Escalade, and this congressman also promised to mow my lawn for a year because he's got enough money to hire somebody to do that. So the question is whether money can corrupt the decisions or influence in some kind of harsh, uh, untoward way uh, voters so that they won't act in the long-term interest of the country or even themselves. At some point, money leads to bad decisions if it's purely applied to sort of short-term gratification. Do you disagree? Yeah, but, but on, on that standpoint, plenty of voters are making bad decisions all the time. I mean, there are plenty of people that, you know, that mortgage their children's future for something they bought because they want to buy something really expensive today. That's right. But, I, but that doesn't necessarily mean we want our political system to be making decisions that way. As I said, I don't think that we should try to force people to not be able to speak or, or, be, or, or use money to try to influence politics. What I'm saying is money often leads to a bad outcome because the people, let's take my example of for-profit education. Those people are getting 90% of their money from taxpayers, so they have every incentive to avoid accountability. A lot of you all probably don't even know about that issue. I didn't know about it until six years ago. So you don't care and you're not paying attention to it. But meanwhile, if a small group of owners of these colleges who are basically Goldman Sachs and Wells Fargo and, and private equity firms can get the money, then they're basically looting $30 billion a year from the Treasury uh, by sort of bribing politicians to support their position on this issue. That's just a bad policy outcome that's entirely the creature of big money dominating politics. We have time for one or two more uh, questions. I know that Josh had a question. Yeah. So uh, you talked about how Citizens United was, you were okay with that because the ruling was based on free speech. And I won't disagree with that in the context of, of what Citizens United was. However, how come um, do you think that the Supreme Court in the past has continued to rule based on free speech and not on the equity of both? So by outside interest dumping money into, say, a local uh, campaign, my vote is being watered down essentially because they're not speaking for me, they're speaking for somebody beyond the constituency. How come you think the Supreme Court doesn't ever want to argue based on the equity of the vote and not just on free speech? So the question for our YouTube viewers again is, uh, why does the Supreme Court focus so much on the uh, uh, freedom of speech aspect of the First Amendment and not so much on potentially, again, leveling, leveling the playing field in terms of political equality? 
because I think that the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law that abridges freedom of speech, and they've decided that a movie like the movie that was made by Citizens United about Hillary Clinton is free speech. And that's, that is supposed to be an absolute uh, uh, mandate that the Supreme Court is supposed to uphold. I think in other contexts it's more disturbing when the court has denied the effects, say, of the voter ID laws that have been passed in a number of states. In a case that came out of Indiana, the court said that it didn't violate the Constitution for Indiana to require IDs, even though the evidence showed there was no danger of voter fraud, and even though um, there was all kinds of evidence that if you required the IDs, all kinds of people would have a hard time voting. Um, so there was a case where they didn't protect equality, and I really, I really disagree with it. But when it comes to speech, I think they do have a special responsibility. And while I think they've decided some of these cases wrong, um, I'm sympathetic on that one because it is sort of pure speech about the most fundamental thing, politics. Yeah. It's just in the past, the Supreme Court has never ever taken a look at it from the view of the activity of the public. So it's always been about free speech, regardless of its campaign finance reform or anything surrounding it. So I, 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 don't, I don't know if that will change when the Supreme Court changes, which it will, with right. the next presidency. Um, and, and why we don't talk about our, our vote being equal versus just free speech simply. So, I don't know. I, don't I think it's a very good question. Sure. <coughs> One last question, Tim. If a member of Congress who is less entrenched is of less value to the special interests because perhaps the member of Congress is relying more on staff because of a abbreviated tenure or because they have less time to develop a relationship with lobbyists, doesn't that argue for term limits as a possible antidote to the influence of big money as candidates? I think it does. Um, I, I do think that term limits might reduce the entrenched nature of people that they go to Washington, they lose, they lose the connection with their district, they live in Washington, they go to Washington parties, they hang with Washington lobbyists. Um, the other side of it, and, and they, they wouldn't have to worry so much in the end about being reelected time after time, so they might actually do what they think is right, whatever that is. <laughs> um, the other side of it is, if you had term limits, you'd have even more ex-members of Congress in Washington. <laughs> that might lower the price of lobbying services, but lead to even more uh, opportunity for people to hire lobbyists to do bad things. <laughs> Just a quick question. Quick question. Is it possible, and do you think it would be valuable, to prohibit retiring members of Congress from being lobbyists? Is that denied? I'd be, I'd be into that. I mean, <laughs> so, oh, do would it make sense to prohibit retiring members of, from Congress of Congress from being lobbyists? Now there is a waiting period, and of course, Trent Lott retired early in order to avoid the waiting period. He said that was one of many factors that went into his decision. Um, so I think it would be good to say to say you can't be a lobbyist. Go do something else. I mean, maybe I'd rather have more members of Congress who would accept the job knowing they couldn't cash out yeah. at the end. You can be the president of a college, not this one because you already have an amazing president. <laughs> but <laughs> you, can be, you can be a governor, you can, you can be an astronaut, you can be a fashion designer. But yes, if Washington would be a better town if you didn't have lobbyists after lobbyists being former members of Congress cashing in on their position. I think that would be a wonderful wonderful structural reform that I fully support, so I thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> Look, uh, Mr. Helprin has been visiting class, uh, classes all day long, and he's been on, and uh, he's been really uh, awesome uh, to, have, to have him here. Uh, and so let's give it up, uh, up uh, for him. Uh, Uh, we do have plenty of events this semester as, uh, as the center, and uh, the next one is already uh, this Wednesday at uh, 4.15, here in the same, same place, uh, East 101, on nuclear non-proliferation, with uh, a Ripon alum, Catherine Schultz, and uh, my colleague, Brian Smith, will engage her in a, in a conversation, just like we did today. We hope to see many of you um, on, on Wednesday, and again, thank you for coming.
Oh, there are refreshments, yes, uh, in the faculty lounge uh, right next door. Please join us.